So Reverend Kristen Stone King is an ordained Methodist minister. She's originally from Kansas, and she is FOR's new executive director of FOR USA as of last August. She started out at Georgetown University working on immigration policy and refugee assistance. She has coordinated compassionate justice projects in California and Nevada. In Lawrence, Kansas, she worked on gun and gang violence, summer feeding programs, and after school programs. She came to FOR from the UC Davis, where she was the ecumenical chaplain for roughly 15 years. Right? Yeah. And um, there are, she's famous for two things there. Um, the one I think she's most proud of, rightly, is that she envisioned and built a multi-faith student housing complex at UC Davis. And there were many hurdles to make this happen. Um, it was a $2.1 million project that she pulled off starting with only $100,000. So um, it is now a national model for multi-faith cooperation. And um, we are just so thrilled at FOR National to have somebody with all of these competencies, all in one person, plus such a big, wonderful heart. It's really a thrill. So I was particularly excited after she got chosen, and I realized I know about this person. So those of you who followed the Occupy events around the country might recall um, a particular event at, at UC Davis where four students were pepper sprayed. That famous photo is very well documented. And the outrage was immediate and widespread. It was kind of the, um, the poster child of uh, police abuse. So in Davis, it was very personal and very emotional and up close. And um, about 1,000 people gathered pretty much immediately right, to confront the chancellor of the university who allowed this to happen. And she had stayed in her locked office, fearful. Her car was, what, a mile away or something? It was, it was a good long walk away. And she was, and there were, there were all these people, and it's getting dark. And so Kristen was on her way to the Bay Area for a conference, and she was called back to mediate this. Um, and so she spoke to the crowd of angry people, basically saying, what do you need? I'm paraphrasing, right? But, and, and they needed to be seen. They wanted her to see their, their emotion, their passion, their fear, their, um, their sense of injustice in this. She spoke with the chancellor, what do you need? She needed to be able to walk safely home. So Kristen mediated this that, that it would be silent. And I saw this on YouTube a day or so later. <laughs> I hope I can tell what I remember, but I just, it's like, this is nonviolence in action. This is creative nonviolence in action. So what I saw um, was those thousand people seated all on both sides of the sidewalk, all the way towards her car, with everyone holding a candle so their face was illuminated. And then Kristen escorting the chancellor out of her office and through this silent, very, very controlled, but very expressive, quiet, silent crowd. In fact, it was completely silent except for the reporter saying, were you afraid? Were you afraid? Do you remember that? <laughs> it was really annoying. But it was, it was, it was a contrast. Um, and I think you turned to her and said, we agreed that this would be a silent walk. Um, but anyway, so I was just thrilled to find that this was the person we were going to have because I was so impressed. I was so moved by that, and, um, and I remember spreading it around. Anyway, Kristen sees her specialty as young adult spiritual development, so this is perfect for us. And interreligious inter engagement as a building capacity for peacemaking. Once again, FOR, all over that. And nonviolence as a spiritual discipline. So I hope you'll join me in giving just a beautiful, warm welcome to Kristen Stone King, the Reverend Kristen Stone King. <laughs> I can tell you it's an absolute privilege to be here with you this year, this community that is a beacon of hope and justice, faithfulness, and peace. This is my first time to see Beck, but I feel as if I'm among family, 
And it's been a delight to get to know some of your stories. Thank you for this invitation and for all that you do and all that you are. It's also a delight for me to be here with two members of my family. Uh, my mom, Roseanne Stone King, is here this year. She took me on my first march in utero. As she, she, as she grieved with others over the death of Martin Luther King Jr. in the spring of 1968. And the first protest that I can remember being a part of is also courtesy of my mom when she took me out of school early one day in fifth grade and loaded my sister and me on a bus with a bunch of other activists. We were headed from Kansas City to Jefferson City, the state capital, to advocate for the ratification of the Equal, Equal Rights Amendment by the state of Missouri. And I remember returning to school the next day and explaining to friends why it made sense for a woman to receive equal pay for equal work. <laughs> And my son, John Campy, is here, and he I don't see him in the room. I think he's off with the youth. He's having a great time and has, has told me already that he wants to come back again next year, so that's a good sign. He accompanied me last, year, last fall to Washington, D.C. when I spoke on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial representing FOR at the 50th anniversary of the March on Washington. And on that trip, John had the opportunity to meet Congressman John Lewis and is now one of his biggest fans. Like all of our tweens and teens today, John is aware and impacted by the complexities of race, inequality, war, and violence as they manifest themselves in 21st century ways. I'm deeply grateful for this community of people of conscience and action that we have the privilege of being a part of. You have asked me to talk about the Fellowship of Reconciliation Centennial, a period that will actually stretch over more than one year as we begin the celebrations next month in Constance, Germany, the site of the famous ecumenical conference on the eve of World War I that led to the founding of the International Fellowship of Reconciliation in 1914. We follow that with celebrations and events related to the founding of the U.S. branch of FOR. Yeah, it's a celebration, right? <laughs> So we'll celebrate the, the founding of the U.S. branch, but as we were admonished by Lucas Johnson, who I know spoke here a few years ago, was, was on the FOR USA NC and then staff, and now is, the, is my counterpart as the lead of the International Fellowship of Reconciliation. He, he said, when is, the, when is the centennial of the Fellowship of Reconciliation? And m most of us said, well, which one? Which was the wrong answer. And Lucas said, there is only one Fellowship of Reconciliation. <laughs> but, but we are really stretching out the centennial celebration, starting with International FOR uh, this, this summer, and then we'll begin uh, the, the, the celebrations of the centennial of the U.S. branch, which was founded in November of 1915 in Garden City, Long Island, New York. And then we'll finish with, with um, culminating events in 2016, so sort of stretching out the period. And a number of people are working on plans for those commemorative events. Um, there was a, a group that met earlier today, but Jennifer Newell and Doug Mackey are both on our centennial committee and would love to talk to you, I'm sure, if you are interested in being a part of any of those activities we have going on to celebrate FOR's centennial. So the Fellowship of Reconciliation is about to be 100 years old, which means that as much as we relish the idea of being a movement, we are also an institution. And institutions have a bit of a bad reputation these days, especially with those of us on the left. And some of this reputation is actually warranted. Institutions can sometimes get in the way of freedom with a level of bureaucracy and a lack of individual responsibility taking that allows a collective unconsciousness to perpetuate. But at their best, 
Institutions allow us to carry out necessary work over generations, to make impact on work that is bigger than any one person can carry out alone, and to pass the baton so that the work can continue. In the community gathered here this weekend, we have folks from the second and third and fourth and fifth generations of FOR. The baton has been passed to us and will be passed on. Institutions at their best are essentially communities that allow us to be honest, to be held accountable, and to have support. They allow us to live out the nonviolent principles of we all have a piece of the truth and the untruth, and we are all interconnected, or as Thich Nhat Hanh would say, we inter are. At their best, institutions help us guard against romantic individualism, providing a framework for faithful practices and holy friendships. Political scientist Hugo Hecklow, in his recent book on thinking institutionally, argues that institutions that are healthy and seeking the best for humanity enable us to be mindful in certain ways exercising a particular form of attentiveness to meaning in the world. Vibrant institutions are crucial to sustaining meaning and purpose in our lives and in our world. FOR is one of the institutions that allows us to be mindful in important ways. To be mindful in part means to listen and to remember. And so on this eve of our 100th birthday, I want to offer for our common reflection three aspects of our history. First, to look at some of our challenges and controversies that FOR has faced. Though history is often told from the perspective of a smooth arc bending towards justice, in FOR, like in the reality of history, there are bumps, Cracks, challenges, sometimes discord, times of great growth, as well as times of contraction. And yet in the faithfulness of the struggle and the messiness of reality, progress is still made, lives are impacted, and peace and justice gain ground. It is in these times when victories small and large are claimed for peace, for compassion, for consciousness and for justice, that we find stories that inspire and motivate us in the struggle. So second, I'll share a few of the stories of people and actions that have moved us with pride and hope over the years. And finally, third, I want to lift up some of the new voices in FOR in perspectives from those folks who represent the fourth and fifth generations of FOR. These are the persons who are reaching back to receive the baton and carry it forward. We've just completed our national council meeting and the freshness and the commitment brought by our new members left us all with excitement and hope. So first, some truth about our history. Mohandas Gandhi, in a letter sent by airmail from Pune, India to Fellowship Magazine, in 1946 says, I suggested in 1920 the use of nonviolence and its inevitable twin companion truth for canalizing hatred into the proper channel. If we today are to live fully in nonviolence, we must be honest with each other now about our present and refuse to romanticize the past. Those places where there has been discord or difference or, conviction, uh, or difference of conviction are useful to us if we use them to understand those places where the, these struggles have helped us clarify what we believe in, what we'll prioritize, and how we will organize the work we have to do for the most impact for peace and justice. Though FOR is seen as the faith-based peace organization that has perhaps championed the use of principled nonviolence as both tactic 
and way of life longer and more fervently than any other organization, the truth is there has always been debate within the, the peace community and correlating movements for social change about the place of nonviolence. I expect this comes as no surprise to many of you. This was one of the single biggest disagreements within the Occupy movement, whether nonviolence was a framework and a, way, and a way of life that demonstrated that which we were advocating for, or whether it was merely a tactic to be used only when seen as the most effective way to achieve a goal. In this aforementioned personal letter from Gandhi to the editor of Fellowship Magazine, Gandhi reiterates his position on nonviolence as a way of life. He writes, hatred is in the air and impatient lovers of India will gladly take advantage of it if they can through violence to further the cause of independence. That is wrong at any time and everywhere. But it is more wrong in a country where fighters for freedom have declared to the world that their policy is truth and nonviolence. Some philosophers of action in India say, we shall never kill our enemy, but we shall destroy his property. Nonviolence in the sense of mere non-killing does not appear to me to be any improvement on the technique of violence. Now today, nearly 70 years after Gandhi wrote the letter, that Gandhi would make such a declaration comes as no surprise to us. His legacy and his, his clear voice have grown in the years since the letter was written. But at the time of the letter, nonviolence as a political philosophy, as a way of life, and a transcendent spiritual discipline in the way Gandhi articulated it and demonstrated it was still finding a hold in the world's social movements. That he chose the Fellowship of Reconciliation through fellowship to assist with that dissemination speaks to his faith in our understanding of the urgency and critical point of the message. While at the same time Gandhi had faith in FOR to carry his message about nonviolence, the FOR was not without its own internal debates. There have been important and rigorous dialogues on both nonviolence and pacifism. In the May 1969 issue of Fellowship, the editors write, Three times in American history, the lifestyle and doctrine we call pacifism has been found in conflict with itself, an adversary in the house, so to speak. They were all times of deep national turmoil and division. The first was just before the Civil War when most of the most ardent and eloquent abolitionists were also pacifists. But men found that their passionate advocacy of the cause of the Negro slave led them into a position very close to the cause of the North in war. The second crisis in pacifism came after the crash in 1929, when the rights of the workers and unemployed to affect whatever change in the economic system was needed to bring them justice found strong support in segments of the FOR, then as now the leading American pacifist group. At about the same time, the National Council of the FOR dismissed its executive secretary, J.B. Matthews, who had declared for violence as a last resort as a weapon of the class struggle. About 12% of the membership supported his position. Now, the Peace and Fellowship goes on to declare in 1969, America is nowhere near a civil war, although divisions are deep and dangerous. Furthermore, the FOR has no such division in its membership, nor has its staff been involved in these divisions, which is actually not true. <laughs> just the same, fellowship feels an obligation to err as fully as may be, just at it, as it has done with issues of unilateral withdrawal from Vietnam, the tactics of resistance and confrontation in demonstrations, 
reform and rebellion in the schools, and direct disruption and destruction in anti-draft activities, the real differences in analysis and approach that prevail with respect to revolution, both internal and among the rising nations abroad. So in an interview for our upcoming documentary film undertaken to celebrate the centennial, and I was hoping to have a rough cut for you all this year, but uh, found out just about a week ago that that was not to be. So next year, next year, I'll have the, the full documentary ready. But uh, we, we did a number of days of filming, um, one in Berkeley, a couple of days in New York, um, a, a day in Santa Rosa. I think Kaylee is working on, I think, some, some potential filming up here in Pacific Northwest to gather the, the stories um, and the voices of those who have been um, leaders and partakers in the movement in the last many years and decades. And, um, and one of those persons is David, McRen David McReynolds, two-time Socialist Party candidate for president and a leader in FOR. And in his interview, he expressed deep disagreements that he had had with Executive Secretary Alfred Hassler over the Vietnam War. McReynolds believed in complete withdrawal and Hassler felt that to withdraw completely without leaving Americans to assist in humanitarian ways um, and to support indigenous Buddhist leadership was to abandon the Vietnamese people. McReynolds said, the FOR was divided internally between Al Hassler, whose hope for some kind of ceasefire where the Buddhists would take charge of the government and those of which I was one of the leading advocates advocates who said that our primary job is to get entirely out of Vietnam, that the structure of the government was up to the Vietnamese, not us. I think Al was taken with the Buddhists, and I don't blame him, but it was a real fight within FOR. It was painful and bitter. Now, I had never heard this story until David McReynolds shared it in his documentary interview. I had always heard of Al Hassler, uh, spoken of like most of the past executive secretaries, spoken of only in very glowing terms. And this was the man, after all, who, who envisioned and published um, through FOR the famous comic book on Martin Luther King and the Montgomery bo bus boycott the comic book that is said to have been passed around in Tahrir Square as a primer on nonviolence and was the inspiration for Congressman John Lewis's best-selling book, March, it was most recently touted on Rachel Maddow's show, and she was waving the comic book around, that, that Al Hassler. So, um, you know, in, in the, the actual transcript of Mick Reynolds' um, interview just really kind of lays into Al. But then at the end, he said, I liked Al. I liked Al. So there's this sense that there's, you know, this really deep um, and painful struggle, and yet still love for each other within the, within the FOR. And of course, that, that, that Al and David um, and others in FOR disagreed about this important issue takes nothing away from their accomplishments and their leadership. But reconciliation is hard work. And sometimes the hardest part is that which we do within ourselves or within our own families, which sometimes the close circles of FOR can feel like. So to sustain us during all kinds of struggles, we have been inspired by the stories of those who have come before us. And one such person is George Hauser. How many of y'all are aware of who George Hauser was? So a few. So George Hauser is still is still living. He is 98. He just turned 98, and he lives in Santa Rosa, California. Retired, retired like multiple times, but finally to Santa Rosa, where one of his children is. And George Hauser was a young man when he was recruited by A.J. Musty to be the Chicago Secretary of FOR. The two had met when Hauser and other students from Union Theological Seminary in New York refused to register for the draft, and A.J. Musty was one of their counselors and champions. After Hauser was released from Danbury Prison, 
after serving a year's sentence, um, he resumed his seminary studies in Chicago. He, Union, Union would not let him back in. So he resumed his, his theological studies in Chicago and began organizing cell groups of FOR all over the city of Chicago. Many focused on race relations, and out of one of these came the idea for the Congress on Racial Equality and the first Freedom Ride challenging interstate segregation laws on buses called the Journey of Reconciliation. And my guess is that many of you know that story well. But other lesser known stories from the time that Hauser worked in Cleveland as FOR's Action Project Secretary challenging Jim Crow uh, are, are, are not so ready in our lexicon and the stories that we tell each other. Um, in the August 1944 issue of Fellowship, Hauser tells the story of trying to integrate a skating rink, an action that he called a failure, although I think that's debatable, because they were unable to make the kind of progress that they had hoped for. He wrote, here is a story about six pacifists in a project of nonviolent direct action, but it is not the kind of story pacifists like to hear. The project apparently was a failure, and I hesitated to put the story in writing, but I have decided to give the main outlines of the experience because it is important for others who are tackling the race problem to realize they are playing with dynamite. For those who optimistically predict that the race problem will solve itself, this experience should reveal the deep intensity of the problem. For persons who feel that to do anything about the race problem is simply to make it worse, the experience should reveal that the situation demands immediate action. For persons and groups practicing nonviolent direct action techniques against racism, it should show that no easy success is possible. So that story, without going into the full story, it was, was a mixed bag. You know, there was confrontation, and there was a response, nonviolent response, and there was connection with some, some union organizers, and I'm sure which led to other, uh, other engagements and other connections and other sources of information that made later actions possible. And one of the actions that was, uh, could be considered very much a success was an action, uh, an attempt to integrate Stoner's Restaurant. And we have an audio clip from Hauser's interview for him to tell that story. Who owned it uh, had uh, uh, a a policy of not serving black people. Uh, and uh, we decided after a period of, a long period of negotiation with Stoner, which led us to put on a campaign to find out what restaurants in the, Chicago, in the center of Chicago uh, had similar policies. We put out a pamphlet entitled Restaurants in the Loop that Do Not Discriminate. And we distributed that and had uh, signs in those that did discriminate. Stoner's was the leading one. And Stoner uh, took the position that if you allow uh, blacks to come in, we will lose our white business and most of our patrons are white women, it will lead to interracial marriage, and we're opposed to interracial marriage, so we will not serve black people. This went on for several months, and then we decided that we would have a national conference of committees of racial equality. There were about 15 or so groups in various cities around the country, and... Uh, that's where the name of Congress of Racial Equality was adopted. The conference was held in Chicago, and the central issue was Stoner's Restaurant. We gathered about 50 people together, I'd say, 
for this occasion in 1942, maybe maybe 43, uh, that we, we, we sent in white groups in threes and fours or twos to monopolize a good part of the seating in the restaurant enough so that they would notice it uh, and then the first interracial group came in consisting of uh, about even black and white and they stood there for an hour and a half uh, being told that they would not be served but then uh, one group was led by a waitress to a, a spot in the rear of the restaurant. But we were told by black employees in the kitchen, don't eat those sandwiches, because we saw them they had eggshells in them and they were made out of garbage. So it was interesting that we gathered some of the employees' support. Then the first group had all was all seated the second interracial group, I was part of the second interracial group. Uh, Stoner went by me at one point, kicked me in the shin. And Jim Farmer point, points out that I said, it didn't hurt Mr. Stoner. Well, I don't know whether I said that or not. <laughs> but uh, what happened was rather dramatic because some white woman who was not connected with our group invited one of the black girls to come and sit at her table with her. She did, and she was served. And then, seeing how this worked very advantageously, uh, others in our group invited members who were in this second interracial group to come and join them. And when the last two and I was one of them, who were seated. The restaurant broke out into a standing applause. It was very interesting how that happened. It's in this booklet, Erasing the Color Line, which I wrote in 1945 in Cleveland. Uh, that uh, here... Uh, finally, a victory was won because it wasn't just our group. It was, we, we won over a lot of people. Uh, and I think it was because of the nonviolent action. No names were called. The police had been called twice. The stoner called them saying there's a riot taking place here. The police came in and it was perfectly ordered, no, no conflict. And uh, the third time the police were called, uh, the police said to Stoner, there's no riot taking place here. If you call us again, we'll take you in. <laughs> uh, and <laughs> that ended that one. It was a, this was a, a, a victory for nonviolent action. It stands out. And there, I might say that this could be duplicated in places like Detroit and Denver. Thank you. <laughs> and then moving forward about 50 years, former Executive Secretary and Interfaith Secretary Doug Hostetter told the story of the Bosnian Student Project, which I know some of, some of you were very involved in. Um, he told this story uh, in his interview for the Centennial documentary, and I hope it makes it into the, to the final cut. But the documentary we're making, it, it, we only have money for 20 minutes, and we have probably, I don't know, 50 hours of footage. So the plan is, you know, we'll, we'll, have, the, we'll have the completed, you know, very polished, 
documentary and then the other our footage we'll, we'll use on our website and find other ways so that those stories can be lifted up too. Um, but Doug, Doug tells the story of the Bosnian Student Project and um, he describes it as the first successful interfaith program of FOR, which is really interesting. If, you, if I shared with those who are in the workshop earlier today that FOR um, is, uh, is, is somewhat different from some of the branches of the International Fellowship of Reconciliation because some of the, some of the branches are, are exclusively Christian. And the U.S. branch of FOR, since really since the 20s, um, has had an interfaith identity, and that's developed, and it's sort of you know had different different evolutions and iterations, and times when it's been stronger, and times when it, it's been less pronounced. But the the mission statement that was adopted um, and revised and adopted last summer begins with the phrase "as an interfaith organization." So it's interesting that Doug. Um, frames the Bosnian Student Project as the first successful interfaith project of FOR. Um, so as an international interfaith secretary, Doug had been struggling with how to respond to the violence in Bosnia in a way that would have integrity. And I've asked Bernie Meyer to share Doug's story that he offered. Um, Bernie worked with Doug um, in New York and knows him well. So thanks, Bernie, for sharing the story. The Bosnian War was an incredible, incredibly painful time for me. I am a Christian and I come from a Christian background. I was watching a war that included genocide in which Christians were killing Muslims in the name of God. We were an organization committed to nonviolence. What in the world could we do? And I was a Christian. I, as a Christian, took it particularly strongly. What do I, as a Christian, do when other Christians are killing Muslims in the name of Christ? I struggled with that for a really long time. I didn't know what to do. I read on it. People were calling. At the time, anti-war activists were going to Sarajevo. They were doing peace demonstrations in Sarajevo. They would be, there would be kind of a tentative ceasefire. Anti-war activists from Europe or the US would come and they would demonstrate for two days and then they would go home and the war would pick up and the war would continue. There was something very inauthentic about that. I said, no, I cannot do that. It's too close to war voyeurism. It's war tur tourism. I felt I had to wait until I could do something significant. There's a local mosque in Rockland County. It's the Sufi mosque. The imam there, Tawam Baryak, called me one day. He told me he discovered all these young Muslim, Bosnian Muslim students had been former students at the University of Zagreb. The best students from Bosnia went to the University of Zagreb. And when the Bosnian War happened and suddenly Croatia became a Catholic country, and all the Muslims or mixed family Bosnian students who were there studying in the University of Zagreb were suddenly kicked out of the university. Their student IDs did not work. Their dining room passes did not work anymore. They were on the street or living together in apartments selling blood or doing whatever else they could just to survive. Tosun had been a professor at Fairleigh Dickinson University before they became an iman. He said, you know, I came back and I wrote 300 letters to 300 colleges and universities, including the university where I taught. I said a genocide is taking place in Bosnia. 
Some of the best Bosnian students are no longer able to attend university simply because of their religion or ethnicity. Will you give a scholarship to qualified Bosnian students? We will help to find housing for them and we will bring them over here. We will buy their books and health insurance, but you need to give them full tuition as they have no resources and they can't get back to Bosnia because in Bosnia, the commun communities that they came from, the urban centers were surrounded by Serb troops, so they couldn't go home. Of the 300 letters that he sent out, he got one response. So Tucson approached me and said, will you and the four help me find schools for the qualified Bosnian students? I said, well, I'm not sure that four does this kind of thing but let me check. Let me try to, to work with local chapters. This was very controversial within the four. Some, someone said, this is what you Mennonites do. <laughs> you, this, you do this social worky kind of stuff, helping people. <laughs> We're pacifists. We're intellectuals and theologians, and we write papers and do conferences. <laughs> and bringing kids out of the war zone. You're dealing with kids. You're dealing with teenagers. Think of all the complications you can get in. So it was very controversial. And so I said, just let me try. So we agreed that I would take the, these Bosnian students, load them into my van, and any four member, especially if you happen to be a chaplain at the college or teach peace studies somewhere, they would connect us with the venues so the students could talk about the Bosnian War and from the perspective of someone who had experienced the Bosnian War. Their stories were excruciating neighbors turning against neighbors, people that had known all their life suddenly becoming your enemy and driving you out, flights across dangerous areas to reach safety in Croatia or to get out of Croatia. At the end of each of these talks, people say, what can we do? And I would say, well, you can write your congresspersons, you can write the UN, and if you want to offer a scholarship to one qualified Bosnian student, you could do that. All you need to do is get a full tuition scholarship from your college or university, and four will work together to finding housing, school books, whatever. You could even do it in the high school. We'll take kids from 15 to 30, single kids who can't go to school because of their ethnicity or the war. It was an amazing program. 162 students came out of Bosnia. We picked up a few from refugee camps, some out of Croatia. A few from refugee camps and other places around the world where we could take all of them and from a variety of ethnicities. Most of them were Muslim or from mixed families, some Croats, a few Serbs, anybody who could no longer continue their education because of the war or due to their ethnicity was eligible for this. We never had a single academic failure. We never had a single academic failure. Oh, thank you. Hostetter goes on to describe that though the students did well academically, FOR realized quickly the need for PTSD counseling, healing, and reconciliation work, and connected the students to professionals and brought them to retreats and other centers where they could do this important healing. 
Doug has uh, connected with some of the students who were in the, the Bosnian Student Project and has, has, has lost track of some of the students, but, it, but is aware that about a third are still living in the United States. Some have gone back to the former Yugoslavia, and others are living in other parts of the world. And we have a, a short clip from one of the students who was part of the program. Hello, my name is Ardian Yashore, and I am a graduate of Bluffton College, now university, from year 2000, where I studied business administration. And now I'm a managing partner in MDA, which is a management consulting company here in Pristina, Kosovo. I want to thank everyone for breaking the rule, accepting a Kosovo student into a Bosnian student project. <laughs> if it wasn't for FOR, I have no idea where I would be today, but I know for sure I wouldn't be where I am today. So thank you, FOR, and happy birthday. <laughs> Hello, my name is Ardian Yashore, and I am a graduate of Bluffton College, now university, from year 2000, where I studied business administration. And now I'm a managing partner in MDA, which is a management consulting company here in Pristina, Kosovo. I want to thank FOR for breaking the rule, accepting a Kosovo student into a Bosnian student project. <laughs> if it wasn't for FOR, I have no idea where I would be today, but I know for sure I wouldn't be where I am today. So thank you, FOR, and happy birthday. So thank you, FOR, for breaking the rules. Did you hear that part? So the current National Council has just finished meeting in New York over the last several days, and Oregon FOR's own Lori Childers has been affirmed as our new chair, and I'm so excited about that, so excited to be able to work as a team. And we are blessed with a number of new and young leaders um, as we take on the work that's before us. And I want to lift up some of these voices and their work. One of these leaders is Ariel Vagosin, an activist who works tirelessly in justice in Palestine-occupied territory. Yes. And and has traveled the globe with a message of food and environment, environmental justice through nonviolence. Ariel wrote in a 2008 issue of Fellowship about a recent sojourn in Palestine. She writes, Mohammed is skinny, 17. He looks at me, doesn't blink, says, are you busy? I say, no, I'm here to see you. Without pause, he says, my father died. Khalil Bashir, at 52, is no more. Khalil Bashir, who survived being shot in the back of the head by Israeli soldiers in April 2001. Khalil Bashir, who taught his family to believe in peace despite having their house directly occupied by Israeli soldiers for five years. Khalil Bashir, whose other two sons were shot, one in his back by the base of his spine and one in his leg, is no more. I am stunned. I never met the man. I have seen videos and photos and knew that he was the headmaster of a German finance school in Gaza. I knew he was well-loved and a true peace worker. In this piece, Ariel commits to bringing back the stories of Palestine, of Gaza, stories that are too big for any one person to hold. I share this story now with you all via Ariel. She commits to living the truth of what her grandmother has taught her, there is no other. There is only us. We are all the others. And then I'm excited about another new member, Dr. Rolanda West, a vibrant leader from Chicago, 
executive director of the Alternative Education Research Initiative, which she founded to assist community organizations and activists in the research and development of programs that provide educational opportunities for those who are incarcerated and for reentry populations. And I'm excited about Latrina Jackson, who self-identifies as a black female-bodied woman who is Southern, raised working class, Muslim, and queer. Latrina, who is part of the Atlanta FOR, says, my understanding of the domestic roots of violence, including racism, lies at the feet of all systems that are perpetuated on an us versus them paradigm. Superiority versus inferiority, or domination versus subjugation. While this paradigm exists in many iterations with a myriad gradations, it usually boils down to an intimately held belief that some of us are more worthy of life and privileged than others, whether by divine mandate or merit. Like any complex work, she says, confronting and deconstructing this unjust paradigm takes a multi-pronged approach. First, I made a personal commitment to constructing more peace and justice-loving paradigms. I pursue this through living in religious and local communities like FOR that are similarly, similarly committed and hold me accountable to these values. Secondly, as a high school teacher, I teach my students conflict transformation methods as responses to interpersonal conflict in an effort to pass on these skills to the next generations. And finally, I, I close by celebrating another new National Council member, Lily Tinker Fortell, niece of Portland-based activist and creator of the Love Makes a Family Project, Bonnie Tinker. But Lily, at the young age of 29, is already a seasoned activist in her own right. Six years ago, she wrote this poem that was published in Fellowship. I'm just reading it. I'm not the author. <laughs> Something tells me Thoreau was already on his way to Walden. King to Montgomery via Boston, Gandhi to the loom and then to the sea, Mother Teresa had long since left her things. I am 23, and the world is here for changing. My life's an open book. My sea of fight is raging. I am an artist, poet, teacher, child. I am afraid this mind of mine is wild. I am a world changer, a resistance wager. I know nothing about anything and everything that matters. I am a survivor, a life thriver. I fight for moments, I live for smiles. Somebody is proud of you, and I won't forget that you thanked me, Sir Callis, because in those tears I saw the power, and in your profound nine-year-old words, I heard everything that was ever meant to be heard. There is a fight out there that is worth fighting for the next two billion years. This world has got to change. It's time to rearrange the systems, the structures, the powers, the pain, because no nine-year-old should be caught in such rain. I am little, one person, I know, but with passion and love we'll put on a show, and two people make four, and four make four million, and I don't know where I'm going, but I know what I'm feeling. I'm here for the sparks, I'm here for the moment, when the flames will erupt and the whole world will know it. I'm here for the movement of a king, I am here for the inspiration a pond brings. I am here for one simple grain of salt, I am here for the next march on land, sand, gravel, or asphalt. I am here, 23, ready to give up my things. I'm here for a challenge, afraid, unsure, but ready to fight war. 
Ready to sing in the streets and stand up to any oppressor the world meets. I am here, positive, not quite ready to ad-lib, but I am ready to stand up to millionaires who don't give a shit about the people they leave behind so they can have a piece of the pie. This selfishness is blowing my mind, and I am here to live life. It's time to stop the lies. Sorry, killers, you're not up for rehire. It's time to start this fire. The flames are getting higher. I am here, ready to scream, free! And the good news is there are whole generations of me. Generation X, generations Y and Z. You're still out there, aren't you, baby bees? Even my grandmas are standing up here with me. And they've lost their manners. We're not saying please, we're saying now. And of course, it goes without saying that Kaylee has already made great contributions through her service on the National Council, through WWFOR, through the Peace Activist Training, through CISPUS, and through many other projects. And so thank you, Seebeck, for taking back the fourth for speaking truth to power, for persevering for peace. <laughs>